Today, however, I want to talk about God's miraculous power and intervention in our lives in the realm of healing, in the realm of healing. We've, we've already said this. Here's our definition of a miracle, so we're all on the same page. A miracle is when God intervenes, when God in heaven intervenes on earth. When our God in heaven intervenes on earth. So how many of you, just, just out of curiosity, how many of you believe that God is able to intervene on earth and he's able to intervene in the life of a sick person and make them well? Anybody believe that today? Okay, some of us believe that today. No, no compulsion to lift your hand. I believe that. I absolutely believe that. My hope is that us as a church and you as an individual you will grow in your understanding and expectation for God to be able to intervene in your life in, in these different ways. In fact, as we read through, and today I'm going to teach the Bible a little differently, a lot of Scripture, because as you read through the Scriptures, there is an amazing amount of healing that God does in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. In fact, Jesus himself did over 40 miracles of healing, different miracles of healing that are recorded in the New Testament. Those, those are just the ones that were recorded. And he, when he did them, he did them for a specific purpose. I mean, blind eyes were open, deaf ears were open, and people could hear. People who couldn't speak would be able to speak. Those who were having seizures and chronic illnesses and long-term things that none of the medical professionals of their day could heal, God did. He even raised people from the dead. And there's, always, there's a reason why he does this. And in John 20, 31, we get a little picture of this. It says, Jesus performed many other signs. So when John finishes writing his book about the life of Christ, he says, Jesus did a whole lot of things that I can't include because if I did, this thing would be so long that you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even chance to read it. But Jesus did, but I'm including these for a specific purpose. And he says, I'm including these. These are written that you may believe that you may have faith, that you may trust that Jesus is the Messiah and that he is the Son of God. Those are two actually different things. Number one, that he is the king of the Israelite people, that he's the king of the Jews, but he's also the Son of God. He's not just the king of the Jews. He's the king of the world. So he's not only the king of the Jews, but he's the king of the world. That's my hope, is that when you read this book and you see the miracles that he did, you might believe this, and that when you believe, you would have life in his name. And that's why he said he came. He came to give us life, the experience of life, and abundant life. And it happens by believing in him. And so Jesus, when he came, and especially when he did miracles of healing, they were to demonstrate his power over sin, over sickness, and over the corrosive effects of sin and death in the world. They were to demonstrate the presence and the authority of God's kingdom. Whenever Jesus came in contact with things, typically things were transmitted from sick people to healthy people, and that's why they were in their lawn, not supposed to touch sick people. Jesus just went beyond that, and he transferred his health, the health of God's kingdom, to the sick person, and he made him well. It was just the opposite of everything that happened in that day. And it was always an expression of God's mercy and compassion. This is, real, this is real important. When Jesus came, he came in flesh and blood to show us who God always was. And God is a merciful God. He's a gracious God. He's a compassionate God. He's a loving God, showing his love for all generations. And when Jesus came and he did miracles of healing, it was always to point in the direction of a merciful and loving God. Always. It wasn't meant just to, you know, be about the miracle or just even to be about Jesus. It did validate Jesus, but it validated the power of God working through Jesus' life. And it's really interesting that when Jesus did this, he didn't just do it so that he could gather a bunch of groupies who go, oh, Jesus, you are so amazing. Although the people around him, that's kind of what they thought. So the disciples were like, Jesus, you're amazing. They were his groupies. I mean, for all intent and purposes, Jesus did it not only to point a big spotlight to God, his heavenly father, but Jesus did it as an example for them because he was going to send them to go and do the same thing. Right? It's, he's going to send them to go and do not only his early followers, but for you and I. In fact, he says this. He says, very truly, I tell you, whoever... Whoever, that means you ever, me ever, whoever. You don't have to be a minister. Jesus says whoever, and this is the qualifier, whoever believes in me, they're going to do the same things that I've been doing. And then he says something that's even more mind-blowing, and even greater works or greater things will he do because I'm going to the Father. 
whoever believes in me, the things that you've seen me doing, you're going to do, and even greater works. And so we see in the early part of the Bible when the, when the today is, is the day of Pentecost, today is the day when God basically inaugurated his church and he launched it in the world through Jesus. And God gives through Jesus the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit comes and all the whoevers who believed in Jesus received the same miracle power that Jesus had. It was the Spirit of God in them. It wasn't them. It was the Spirit of God in them working through them. And this is what happened in the early, with the early followers followers the apostles they performed many signs and wonders among the people and it was all about it wasn't about the miracle and it wasn't about them it was all about the same thing that Jesus did it was pointing a big spotlight on the God who was supplying the power to show his grace and his mercy and his compassion to his people and he did it through miracles whenever you see a miracle of healing happen that is God expressing his mercy and compassion through somebody else and bringing forth healing even over physical circumstances and illnesses And so the early followers, and then this guy named Paul, this is what it says about him, he was crazy. God did extraordinary things through Paul. Listen to this. Even the items that had touched him were taken from him and put on the sick, and their illnesses were cured. And evil spirits even left. And again, it wasn't so that Paul's name would become great, and he could have a YouTube channel, and he could have a lot of people subscribe to all of the items that were taken from his body. That's not it. It says, so that the name of the Lord Jesus. It was always a sign and a wonder that pointed to the reality of who Jesus is and what Jesus accomplished when he died on the cross, paid the price for our sin, but he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. And so whenever there was healing, that was a demonstration. He is not dead. He is alive. And the same things that he's doing, his followers are doing. And it's the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. It lives in his followers. And it is raising people from sickness. It is raising people from death. And it wasn't just his early followers. It was for all who would believe in his name and who would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That means you and I get to be a part of the whoever. Whoever believes in Jesus will do not only what he did, but we will be able to do even greater works than that. Amazing, right? So that, that's what we're talking about today. Some of you come in and you go, I don't believe any of that. That's okay. Stay with me. I understand. I understand. It's difficult to believe that. But I believe that God wants us to be a church that believe that that same power that worked through Jesus, that same power that worked through his early followers, that same power that healed the sick and raised the dead, that same power works through you and I as believers in Jesus Christ. When we are united in Christ, God gives us his spirit and that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, God said, now dwells in us. It raises our dead life out of sin and it gives us the ability to do the same things and even greater things than Jesus did so if you ask me Greg do you believe that God heals absolutely absolutely have you ever seen it absolutely in fact I I was very fortunate when when I was when I was a brand new Christian and hadn't yet experienced disappointment of having you know when you when you're a brand new Christian in fact if you're a brand new Christian come up and see me afterwards I need you to pray for me because you haven't yet experienced the disappointment that jades some of us that causes some of us to go like you know God do you really do that anymore I hadn't experienced that I was just praying for everything if something was sick I read in my Bible that God healed the sick I wasn't smart enough or mature enough or didn't have the wisdom enough to go, maybe I shouldn't do it. So I just prayed for people. And one of the people that I prayed for was my fourth grade Sunday school teacher. I just, I wanted to, I wanted her to know that all of her hard work and all of my rascalness, God finally got a hold of my life. And so when I came to know Christ when I was 20 years old, I called her up. I said, I got some good news to tell you, but I got to tell you in person. And so I went and I told her, I came to know Jesus. And she was like, no, you didn't. (laughs) Yes, I did. And she was so excited. But in her house, there was a little bit of darkness and there was a little bit of sadness I can sense in her. So I I said, you know, how are you? And she said, you know, I just got diagnosed with breast cancer. And they have, you know, they take an x-rays and I have some nodules on my breasts. And and um, they don't know what kind of cancer or what it is yet, but I have breast cancer. And she was sad, and the room was dark. And again, I had just come to know Jesus, and all I know is, man, Jesus changed me from the inside out. If he could do that, then surely he can do anything. And I just said, can I pray for you? 
And I read, I read, you know, look, God did this. Why wouldn't he do that through me, through you? All we got to do is ask him. And so I just prayed. I just prayed as best as I could. Jesus, you did it before. Why wouldn't you do it now? And Jesus, I just humbly, we just ask you to do a miracle. And there was no lightning. There were no flashes. There was no feeling. She still was very sad. And I left. She called me back. Or actually, I called her. And then she told me a couple weeks later, I went back to the doctor, and they couldn't, they did x-rays, and the nodules are gone. And uh, to be honest with you, I was like, really? (laughs) (laughs) Right? I mean, it's just my humanness. God does that. That was my first experience with something like that. And here's my hope for us in this series is that our faith would grow. Our faith would grow because when our faith grows, there's an expectation, there's a zeal, there's a pursuing, not for a miracle, not for the things that God can do, but for the God who does them. We pursue him, and you know what we do when there is that hope and that expectation is we begin to pray more. When we lose our hope and our expectation, we begin to pray less and ask less. It's not that we don't believe. There's just not the energy to pray and to to seek. Some of you may be able to identify with this. You go, yeah, yeah, there was a time when I was really going for it, and something happened, I kind of backed off. My hope for us is that we will grow in our faith, we will pray, and we will bathe our faith in prayer, and God will do amongst us, create an arena for miracles to happen. The things that God wants to do, he just wants to do for people who are pursuing him. It makes them so happy when we pursue him. If you're a daddy or a mommy, you get this, man. When your kids go to you and they trust that you can provide for them or do something for them, you, they, you don't go, I mean, next time your kids come and ask you for money, let me just put another spin on it, they trust that you're going to do something for them. Maybe. <laughs> I love when my kids ask me to help them with things. I do. Even if I can't, do it in the moment. I love that because that means, Daddy, I believe that you have the capacity to do something for me in this situation. I love that. I think our Daddy loves to be pursued. And my, my desire for us is that we would grow in our faith, we begin to pursue God together and create an arena where miracles can happen because there's an expectancy for them to happen. Uh, expectation creates, as we already said, arena for miracles to happen. So, I think one of the hard parts with this whole thing, though, is that, let me, let me ask this question. How many of you have ever prayed for somebody to be healed and they didn't get healed? Anybody? Okay, so some of us have. Lots of us have. Right? That, that's hard. That's hard because how do we reconcile the fact? In fact, oftentimes we go, God, I know you can and I think you should, but you didn't. So we, 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 don't know what to, we don't know what to think at that point, right? God, I believe you could, but I've been praying for my wife's migraines for years now, and it doesn't seem like you're doing anything. God, I believe you could, but I've been praying for my son's depression as he goes through college, and it doesn't seem like you're doing anything. Why, why don't you? I think you should. I know you could, but why don't you? And that's really hard, right? God, I, I know that you could, but why don't you? Some of you are struggling with chronic illnesses. You've had it for a long time, and I don't have an answer for it, but we know. God, I, I know you could. I believe you can. I've seen you even do it for somebody else, but why don't you do it for me? And it just puts that question mark up there. Maybe you, like me, you know somebody who at a, either a young age or somebody was doing so much good, got cancer, and they died, and people were praying. And when I was, when I, another thing that happened right after that moment of prayer and seeing that woman healed is there was a baby in our church, a three-year-old by the time I got there, who had been born with a chronic uh, congenital disease in the heart. And it was a child, the son of the pastor, was three years old, had spent much of his life in ICU. And the whole church was praying, and we'd go there, and we pray, and we're asking God, and by faith we're believing, Lord, we know you can. We're asking you to do this. And the baby died at three years old. And like, like most normal people, man, your, your faith gets rocked. And you, begin to, you begin to wonder, like, how do I approach a God that I know can but oftentimes doesn't do what I want him to do or what I think he should do or the way that I want him to do it? How do we approach that kind of God? So that, that's really what I want to address today because the desire for most of us is to have a faith in God, but sometimes those kind of moments, cause, it rocks our world, causes us to take a step back, causes us to pursue a little bit less, and we just begin to shrink 
into the shadows and we don't pray as much and we don't seek as much and we don't expect as much and then the environment for God to actually do what God wants to do shrivels. And what we want to do is even in the midst of that, I believe there is a way that we can continue to approach God. And so I want to talk about that. How do we approach a God who doesn't always do what we want him to do and doesn't always do it the way that we want him to do it? Even though we know he could and we, we think he should. How do we approach that kind of a God? And so this was, this was something that actually happened a lot in the Bible. This is a tension that happened a lot in the Bible. And so here, here's a big thought, and I know, I know that you know this. Our God heals. Our God heals. It happens over and over in the scriptures. I've experienced it in my life. Many of you have experienced it. You know that. But our God does not heal everybody all the time. He does not. He does not. He is sovereign. He chooses, and, and, and again, he sees from such a bigger place. So in the scriptures, this happened a lot. And I just want to look at this guy named Paul because he had it happen to him several times. And I think the reason why he had it happen several times is because he prayed for lots of people. And so this guy, Paul, he is the guy in the new part of the Bible after Jesus is raised from the dead. He is the guy that writes about half of the, new, of the letters, 13 of the 27 letters in the New, it's called the New Testament. Paul writes them. And Paul did more miracles of healing and more miracles, period, than anybody in the New Testament other than Jesus. But there's three cases where it's very clear Paul did not get the answer that he was hoping for. One of them is this guy named Trophimus, who was his traveling partner. He was his missionary buddy. Erastus stayed in Corinth, it says, and I left Trophimus sick. I had to go. I had to continue on, and he couldn't come with me because he was just too sick to. He saw a lot of miracles, but in this case, he did not. And then it, it kind of gets closer to home. There's a guy named Timothy who's, who's kind of like his son. I mean, this is his apprentice. This is, this is a guy, he says, man, I love this guy so much. I'm not just going to teach him things. I'm going to pour my life into him. And he says about Timothy, he says this. He tells him, Timothy, it seems, oftentimes battled with just physical ailments, especially regarding his stomach. I don't know if it was just stress or nervousness, whatever, but with Timothy, he says this, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach. The water back then was not very good. Use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. Timothy, you keep having these sicknesses, so take a little bit of wine to help you. And then Paul, even with himself, he had this chronic eye thing going on. In fact, it never really says it's resolved. It bothered him so much that he pleads with God. He calls it, he calls his eye situation, like maybe some of you call your chronic illness, a messenger of Satan. This thing is like Satan, the Satan that's just tormenting me. And he says, I pleaded three times with the Lord to take it away. It's not like he just prayed once. He prayed three times. And he didn't just pray. He pleaded. Any of you ever pleaded for something? Come on, God. I'm trying to do so much for you. And he's pleading with God. And God says, buddy, I understand you want this to happen, but I got something different for you. And so he says, he didn't do it. God instead says to him, my grace is sufficient. And, and Paul gets something that we now are recipients of, an understanding of the power of God in our weaknesses and limitations that he would, I guess God feel, felt like he wouldn't have gotten any other way. So Paul lived with this for the rest of this, his life, but he gets this incredible revelation. And, and if Paul were here, I'm, I'm going to put some words in Paul's mouth. How did Paul deal with this disappointment? I think there's always one of two ways we can go with disappointment. We, we, we can do, and I'm going to put words in Paul's mouth. Paul could have said, you know what? I'd rather play God because I know what's best to do. And so I can just let that disappointment drive me to resentment that's what we do. We let it drive us to resentment, hesitation. You know what? I'm just going to stop trusting as much. And then just entitlement. God, you owe me. You could have done that. You should have done that for that situation. You didn't, so you owe me. And we kind of live with this chip on our shoulder like God owes us something. I think Paul would have said, no, I'm, I'm going to not let it drive me in that direction. I'm going to continue to put my life in the hands of God because I am not him, and I trust that in his goodness, he is working all the things in my life together for his good, for my good, and for his greater purposes, even though I may not be able to stand it now, and I'm going to allow it to drive me instead of to hesitation and fear and entitlement and, you know, all of that. I'm going to allow it to drive me to humility. 
I'm going to allow it to drive me to a greater awareness of my own weaknesses and my own limitations. Right? When we're disappointed, we realize, you know what? As a human being, I control a lot less than I thought I controlled. I'm going to allow it to drive me to empathy, uh, understanding other people who are suffering and who are in pain. I'm going to allow it to drive me to an, a greater appreciation for God's grace, His miraculous power to sustain me, even in my weakness, and to save me. I'm going to allow it to drive me, and this is really big, to gratitude. Gratitude for when God gives His mercy to you and I. Instead of entitlement, I think Paul would have said, man, allow it to drive you to gratitude. Allow it to drive to that place of appreciation. And we kind of get a little glimpse of this because there's another guy that traveled with him who also didn't get healed when Paul wanted him to, but then later on God healed him. And look what, God's, look what Paul says. This guy named um, Epaphroditus, and it says this. Indeed, he was ill, and he almost died. Epaphroditus almost died, but God had mercy on him. This is real important. He didn't go, you know what? God finally did what I've been asking him to do. God did what he deserved and what God owed me. You know what? Whenever God heals, it is not because he owes you anything. It's not because you and I deserve anything. Truth be told, if God gave us what we deserved, think think about your life. You know your life, right? If God gave you what you deserved, I'll, I'll speak for me, it wouldn't be good. I don't want what I deserve. (laughs) I don't. I want what I don't deserve. And God says, when I healed your friend, it was out of my goodness and my mercy that I did that. It's not because you're entitled to it. It's not because I owe you or you deserve it. It's because I am good and I am gracious and I am compassionate. And whenever we see God's healing hand in the earth, that is a sign not of, oh, we got what we deserve. That was my right. No, 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 no. It is a sign that God gave us what we didn't deserve. We got mercy. We got grace. We got compassion. We got his love. And we just go, thank you, God. Just like Paul said, thank you, God, for your mercy towards him and for me because I really really didn't want to lose my friend. I needed him. So you didn't just help him. You showed mercy to me. Thank you, God, for that. Look, when God heals, it's an expression of his divine mercy. It should never be received or expected as a right, an alleged or assumed right. That's just being presumptuous. So we should come to God in faith, believing that he can, but not making the assumption that he should. God, I know you can, but it's not, and you should. You need to do this for me. Mm -hmm. It's mercy. It's all mercy. My my dad, my dad turned 80 this year, just a couple days ago. I called him up. I said, Dad, I know after 80 years of life, you've experienced a lot of disappointment. How do you you navigate that? How do you navigate the disappointment in your life? You're going to try something great. You're going to experience disappointment. My dad is a great man. I, I love him. And without skipping a beat, and I was kind of surprised. I thought he'd either think about it a little bit more or he'd just say, you know, son, I'm not really sure. He said, Greg, you know what? Everything that I have in this lifetime, good and bad, it is all for God's glory. And I believe that. I believe that God is getting glory out of the good and I believe that he's getting glory out of the bad and I'm not God and I can't see everything that's going on. So I just trust that he's getting glory. So it's all good. I thought that is such a mature perspective. We receive healing. We receive it as a mercy of God. And I think Paul would say the same exact thing. God heals oftentimes, and oftentimes he does not heal. He doesn't do what we want. So how do we handle that? And I think sometimes, especially well-meaning people, they handle it the wrong way, right? Sometimes we, we drive people farther away from God and faith in Christ than we actually draw them and build their faith. And they'll do it by saying, you know what, if you only prayed more, if you only tried harder, if you only prayed right, if you only had more faith, if, and, and if you're a parent, you know this pressure, right? Your child does something and then somehow the blame comes up to the parent. The parent thinks, must be a sin in my life. Or somebody says, maybe it's sin in your life. And, and inadvertently, instead of helping build faith, we drive people away from faith. And unfortunately, there are people who are not in church today. They're not in the fellowship with other believers in Christ. They're, they're maybe not even in relationship with God because somebody said something unsensitive like that. So let me just encourage you not to do that. Not to do that. Whenever it happens, it is a mercy of God. So as we go on here, what is our approach? What is our approach from a God who can heal but oftentimes, he doesn't. He doesn't always do it. 
Three reasons, real quick, that Jesus didn't do miracles. Number one, Jesus refused to perform miracles just to prove himself. Just to prove himself. In Mark 8, 11, it says this. There's an interaction Jesus had. Pharisees, they came to him and they began to question Jesus. And this is why they were questioning, not to find out, not to see if they should believe, but to test him. They're trying to look for fault. And they asked him for a sign. In other words, prove that you are who you say you are. Demonstrate it. And he did. <sighs> These guys, they're always doing this. Why does this generation ask for a sign? He says, truly, I tell you, I'm not going to give you a sign. I'm not going to give you what you want. I'm not going to do it. I'm not your puppet. I, I, want, I want to be pursued, but I will not allow you to push me into anything. And God will not allow. God loves to be pursued, but he will not allow us to in any way try and pity eyes him or manipulate him to do anything on our behalf. He doesn't feel compelled to do that. God does what God does. He doesn't allow himself to be pushed into that. Second thing is Jesus never performed a miracle that interfered with God's ultimate plan. Never. This is a really funny incident. The reason why it's funny is because of the miracle that Jesus chooses to do in this case. Uh, toward the end of his life, a guy named Judas betrayed Jesus. Jesus was in a garden. He was praying with some of his followers. And, the, and these military guys, they came to arrest him. And in an attempt to save Jesus, this guy named Peter pulls out his sword and seemingly tries to cut off the head of one of the guys that's coming. And he misses and he cuts off his ear. Now look, think, think about you. The military is pursuing you to take you away. And your friend cuts off somebody's ear. What do you do? I, I, I tell you what I do. I go, let's get out of here. And we run, right? They look for the ear in the dark. And Jesus gets the ear and he heals the guy. He heals the guy's ear. It's recorded. It was a servant of, of the high priest. He heals the ear. And in the same moment, though, they have an opportunity. They, they, this is Jesus. He could call down angels to rescue them and do a more important miracle seemingly to the disciples, and he doesn't. He heals the guy's ear, which is a big deal for the guy who lost his ear. It's not so big for his disciples, though. They're expecting the blind them so we can run miracle, and it doesn't happen. So Jesus tells them, man, I could have called down thousands of angels. You know that. He said, and instantly... They would have rescued us, but I didn't. I refrain from temporary miracle because of God's eternal purpose. God will never do something temporarily that overrides God's eternal purpose. And so here's what he says. But if I did that, if I escaped and if I called down angels, how would the scripture be fulfilled? And the scripture has to be fulfilled. So God chose the eternal, Jesus chose the eternal purpose and he always does over the temporal desires of man. And so lastly, Jesus didn't do miracles where there was no faith. And I, I, this was one of my favorite stories in the Bible because these guys are sitting around in, in Jesus' hometown of Capernaum or in Capernaum right now. He may be at Peter's home and the home is crowded with all these people that are there and they're there to hear Jesus. And there's a group of them who are there to test Jesus. These are the Pharisees. These are the lawyers. These are the guys that are trying to find fault and reason not to believe. And it says this. One day Jesus was teaching and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that were sitting there, and the power of the Lord was present to heal the sick. But you don't hear about anybody getting healed. In fact, in other versions of it, in Mark and Matthew, we read them last week, it says God didn't heal any, or he only healed a few, because they just didn't have any faith for it to happen. They weren't expecting it to happen. They weren't expect. this is Mary, you know, this is the son of Mary and Joseph. This is the carpenter God. We grew up with him. We know him. Surely he's not going to be able to do it. So there was no expectation. So Jesus wasn't healing. And, and somehow, faith matters to God. Our faith matters to God. Our trust matters to God. Our hope in Christ to do something in our lives matters to God. In fact, there are these different versions of things that happen. These, I'm, I'm just going to read three of them, where God comes and he says, it's because of your faith that I did what I did. There's a woman who has this chronic bleeding, and she comes up in the midst of a crowd, and she touches Jesus' cloak. And when she does, she is instantaneously healed. And like the parting of the Red Sea, Jesus turns around and goes, wait, what happened? Who did that? 
And everybody's kind of afraid, like, uh, well, we're not sure if this is a good who did that or a bad who did that. So everybody parts. And there's this woman who has had this chronic bleeding for all of her life, and doctors couldn't help her. And she's there healed. And she said, I did that. And Jesus tells her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Our faith matters to God. You came to me believing that I could do something for you. That matters. I appreciate that. Good job. That pleases me. And because of that, you're healed. Our faith matters to God. There's this other guy. You put up the next scripture. There you go. Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. These 10 lepers come and God heals them all. Only one of them comes back and bows down and worships and thanks God. And Jesus says to that leper, you can get up now. Your faith has healed you. And then this last one, there's this guy named Bartimaeus. He can't see. He's blind. And he's so disrespectful. Everybody else is wanting a piece of Jesus. And Bartimaeus is crying out. All he knows is that Jesus' entourage is walking by. He's going, Jesus! Jesus! And his followers are like, calm down already, you know. Shh, don't you know who this is? And he's like, Jesus! And Jesus says, wait, wait, wait. What do you want? He says, I want to see. And then he heals them. And Jesus says this, go. Your faith has healed you. Our faith matters to God. Our faith matters to God. So how do we approach God? We approach God in faith. In faith. Some of you are going, nah, I got such small faith. You know, Jesus try, tried to make it as easy as he could. He said, even if you have faith like a little mustard seed, you can say to this man, and he's not talking literally, he's talking figuratively. Even if you're f the quality of your faith is small, even if you have a faith, he's not necessarily talking about like a quantity, it's not like there's a quantity, but even if your faith has not, and when he talks about great faith, it's faith that's been bathed in prayer. You, you know somebody has great faith when they keep coming and they keep coming and they go, I didn't get it yet, but I'm believing. I, get, I didn't get, I got a child like this. He is so persistent that eventually I go, you know what? Okay, just you got it already. Jesus, the great faith is faith that's been bathed in prayer. In fact, Jesus says in this particular incidence, this thing only happens if you pray and you fast. But he says, even if you have small seed faith, like a little mustard seed, bring it. Bring it to me. This morning, I want to encourage you. You go, you know what? My faith is small. My faith is weak. I have doubts. I have questions. I would say, welcome to the human race. All of us have imperfect faith. There's nobody in this room who has perfect faith. We don't. We come to God and we have questions and we have doubts and we have things that are bouncing around in our brain and experiences that we have. It's never that I question whether he can. I, I wonder though, will you do it for me? Will you do it in this situation? And there are things that bounce around and none of us have perfect faith. And God says, bring that faith. I will work through what you bring to me. So wherever your faith is, in fact, even if you have small faith, bring that faith. God works through that in our lives. He wants to cause it to grow and get greater and greater and greater. So how do we approach God? We approach God in faith. And then, you know, if you were to go get, if you were to go, go and say, you know, I want to go sailing. And, you know, you stood on shore. And so here's what we need to know. Only God can do what God does, right? So only God can make the wind blow. And if you're a sailor, you know this, right? You've taken your boat out on the, on the, on the ocean. You want to do sailing. And there's no wind. You put your sail up, but there's no wind. And you go, well, you know, I tried. You will never, however, be able to sail if you never put your boat on the water and you don't pull up your sail. God, God, only God can make the wind blow. I agree with that. But only you and I can put ourselves in a place where the wind is actually hitting our sail. And that place is faith. So we come to God in faith. We put our boat on the water. We pull up our sail. And we say, God, you got to do what only you can do. Please make the wind blow. Not because I deserve it or have earned it, but because you are a merciful, gracious, and compassionate God. And so I come before you in faith and in humility. Now, I'm not just believing you for what you do for me, but for who you are. My faith in God is not a momentary faith based upon the fact that he either did or did not answer my prayer. My faith in God is based on the fact of who he is. He is my Savior who died on a cross. This is what he did for me. This is how I know he loves me. Not because he answered my prayer, but because he died on a cross and he rose from the dead. That's how I know he loves me. My faith is not based upon what he does. It's based upon who he is and what he did when he died and he rose again 
from the dead on that cross. And so we come to God in faith, we come to God in humility, and we come to God with his perspective in mind, his eternal perspective. And, and this is what I mean. More important to God than the healing of our physical body is the healing of your unseen soul, is the saving of your soul. Think about that. For God, the highest priority is not just the healing of your physical body. He cares about that. He wants us to put our boat on the water. He wants us to pull our sail up. He wants us to believe that he can make the wind blow. But his highest priority is the saving of our soul. Jesus said, man, I came that you might got life and you might have abundant life. He said, I came not for the healthy, but I came for those who are sick. I didn't come for the righteous. I came for the unrighteous. I came to seek and to save those who are lost. Ultimately, he said, this is why the Son of Man came. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to die on a cross in their place to pay the price for their sins. The just dying for the unjust. The, un the righteous dying for the righteous so that they could become the righteousness of God. So that you and I who are dead in our sins could be made alive together with Christ. Raised up with him. Seated him with him in the heavenly places. For by grace we've been saved through faith not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. That's why Jesus Christ came. That's why this guy named Paul said, man, I've been crucified with Christ. I mean, as far as my life on earth, the most important thing is Christ living in me. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. And he says, so the love of God compels me to live. And not just live for myself, but live for him who died and who rose again. It just changes everything when we embrace God's eternal perspective. Your highest priority is not just the healing of your body. Your highest priority is the saving of your soul. Your highest priority is to use the 70, 80 years of life. If you're Okinawan, you know, 110, 120, <laughs> right? It's true. To give God glory. I'm going to invite the worship team to come and join me. That is our highest priority. So, look, God wants us to approach him in faith, to approach him in humility. In humility, just, just says, God, you know better than me, and so I trust in your decision. Whatever your decision is, I know you can. I'm asking you humbly, please, and I know that whatever your decision is, I'm going to be good with that because whether it's good or bad for me, I pray that you would be glorified through it all. If you heal, that this would point a big spotlight to Jesus. It would only confirm everything that he did. If you didn't heal, it still just confirms in my heart, God, that you are merciful, you are good, you are a compassionate God. And we continue to believe that God's highest priority is not only the healing of our bodies, but it is the salvation of our souls. God wants to use us to see people healed so that his name can continue to make, be great and to see people saved, which is even greater than that.